for joining uh, us today uh, at RHEL Northeastern Islands for a Northeast Region view of competency-based learning, definitions, policies, and implementation hosted by the Northeast College and Career Readiness Research Alliance. So at this time, I would like to introduce uh, Jessica Brett, who is the facilitator for the NCCRA, who will be moderating today's webinar. So good, after Jess good afternoon, Jessica, and uh, have a great session. Thank you, Peter, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today for our webinar on competency-based learning. It's great to have so many, jo so many joining us today from, as Peter mentioned, from out our around the region as well as throughout the country. And it's great to have so many different roles represented. It looks like we have teachers, district staff, researchers, SEA staff, and higher ed. So it's great to have you all with us today. As Peter mentioned, my name is Jessica Brett, and I serve as a facilitator for the Northeast College and Career Readiness Research Alliance, the host of today's webinar. I'm joined today by Josh Cox, who serves as the researcher for the Alliance. Our program today will include two presentations on competency-based learning, a research presentation by Aubrey Schopner Torres, a consultant with RHEL Northeastern Islands, and a case study from the state of New Hampshire presented by Paul Leather, Deputy Commissioner of Education at the New Hampshire Department of Education. Following each presentation, there will be an opportunity for a brief question and answer period. Please feel free to post your questions in the chat, and we'll pose them to the presenters during the Q&A. Following the two presentations, we will have a reflection by Julia Freeland, a senior research fellow from the Clayton Christensen Institute, who works in the field of competency-based learning. After all our speakers, we'll have a collaborative discussion with all our presenters based on your questions. Uh, we'd like to take a minute to get a sense of the familiarity of our audience with some of the topics we'll be discussing today. We have three polls, so if you could please take a minute. Um, they'll each be coming up one at a time, just so we can get a sense of what everybody knows about competency-based learning and New Hampshire's PACE program. Um, and it's great to see it looks like people are either very or somewhat familiar, mostly familiar with CBL, which is great. I know there's always a lot more to learn, so I hope uh, we'll be able to teach you and learn a lot more about that today. So uh, I think we're just about ready to go on to the next poll. So you know, we know there's a lot of variety out there in terms of you know, a lot of school districts are considering implementing CBL, and some are just starting. So just trying to get a sense of who we have on the webinar today. It looks like right now we're about evenly split between those who have implemented or considering implementing, which is great. It's, we'll really touch on, there are a lot of issues at, at both ends and that cover both ends, so I think we'll cover a lot of that today. So another five seconds on this one, and then I think we'll switch on to the next poll. I think we're ready for our last poll, which is about um, New Hampshire's PACE program, which we'll be hearing more about today. Uh, it's, it's great that we have Paul Leather, who's sort of the pioneer behind this, so it's a great opportunity to hear a lot about this program, which I think is a great thing coming out of New Hampshire and a lot of familiar. And it looks like um, we'll have a lot to talk about, and we'll really be able to share a lot with you and those of you who are not familiar with it. So. He's definitely the person to learn it from, so it's a great opportunity. Glad you're here today to join us. So I think we'll move back to the slides. Thank you all for filling out the polls. And I'd like to just take a minute to go over the goals for today's webinar, which are to disseminate the study findings and implement, implement, implement implications of RHEL Northeastern Islands publication titled Competency-Based Learning, Definitions, Policies, and factors related to implementation. We also want to discuss the implementation of the competency-based learning reform by looking at a pilot program in New Hampshire, performance assessment of competency education, also known as PACE. Lastly, through both presentations and our discussion, we'll discuss the facilitators and challenges raised by these studies. Now I'd like to introduce today's presenters. Our first presenter is Dr. Aubrey Schopner Torres, an assistant professor in the Education Department at St. Anselm College and who also served as a research consultant for North, RHEL Northeastern Islands. Prior to her work at St. Anselm, she was a senior research associate at Education Development Center, 
where she served as the principal investigator on several studies for RAL Northeastern Islands and conducted large-scale program evaluations for the Nellie May Education Foundation. Many of these research studies were focused on competency-based and student-centered learning education reforms. Our second presenter is Paul Leather, whose background and experience in education, counseling, and administration in New Hampshire spans three decades. He is the Deputy Commissioner of the Department of Education in New Hampshire and has also served for 18 years as the Director of the Division of Career, Technology, and Adult Learning for the Department, overseeing statewide initiatives such as high school redesign, extended learning opportunities, and dropout prevention, as well as the administration of vocational rehabilitation, adult education, career and technical education, tech prep, and school guidance and counseling. In 1997, as part of the New Hampshire School to Career efforts, Mr. Leather began the journey to create a state model for a competency-based student transcript. This effort resulted in the development and implementation of the New Hampshire competency-based assessment system, and ultimately to the student mastery model now in place as part of New Hampshire school approval standards. More recently, he has led the development of a first-in-the-nation, next-generation educational accountability model called Performance Assessment of Competency Education, or PACE, approved as a pilot program with four, dis four New, Hampshire New Hampshire districts in March 2015. Our discussant today is Julia Freeland, a senior research fellow with the Clayton Christensen Institute. Her research there focuses on innovative policies and practices in K-12 education. She currently writes a weekly blog and examines competency-based education policies, blended learning school models, and initiatives to increase student social capital. She has authored several reports on competency-based learning and blended learning. I want to thank all our presenters for joining us today. And please remember to post your questions in the chat during the presentation, and we'll address them during the Q&A section of the Bridge event. I'll now turn it over to Aubrey for our first presentation. Great. Thanks, Jessica. And it's a pleasure to be here. And thanks so much, everyone, for joining. And hopefully this presentation gives you a good overview of the study. Uh, in this presentation, I'll briefly discuss why we conducted the study, the research questions that guided our work, and the research methods. If you would like more information about the background and the research methods, um, there's a copy of the report down below in the download today's files, or just feel free to ask. I'd like to spend most of the presentation going over the findings and reviewing what we found in particular about the four main elements of competency-based learning and the needed supports to help with implementation efforts. Uh, Jessica, Josh, and I were on the research team for this project, so if you do have a question at any time, we're in this unique position that they can help in answering them right away, um, or you can uh, ask them at any time and we can address them after the presentation. Uh, this project was also done in very close collaboration with members of the Northeast College and Career Readiness Research Alliance, and I see a couple of them are here. Um, they were extremely helpful in guiding the project and providing feedback throughout. We work closely with members, um, which includes Paul Leather, uh, to identify research projects and ways to support the work of our member states as they assess and enhance secondary school initiatives designed to increase college and career readiness. Members of the Alliance very quickly identified competency-based learning as an area where further research was needed to help support state efforts. So what the heck are we talking about here? So competency-based learning, which is sometimes known as competency education, proficiency-based learning, or mastery-based learning, among many other terms, uh, is an education reform where students must demonstrate mastery of a defined set of competencies to advance and graduate rather than completing traditional credit requirements that are based on time spent in class, which is commonly known as seat time. So in a traditional model, as long as you show up to class and you manage a minimum average, you can earn credit, even if you do not understand all the concepts and skills that were taught in the class. In a competency-based model, if the concept or skill is one of the competencies for the course or is a graduation requirement, then you cannot get credit or graduate until you've demonstrated mastery of each of those competencies. So that, in a nutshell, is a very brief definition. Uh, Competency-based learning is pretty widespread in the Northeastern Islands region. You can see here the history of legislation and Board of Education policy that has been passed. It started in Rhode Island and their revision to their diploma requirements and then was quickly followed by New Hampshire, Maine, Connecticut, and most recently Vermont. Massachusetts has no policy, but the Department of Education has provided professional development sessions and they do support the movement. 
New York has no policy to support this either. They've really been focused on the Common Core implementation, but they see this as something that they might move to next. So one of the first issues that Alliance members identified was that each state had different policies and even different terms that were being used. They wanted to work together and learn from one another, but they really wondered, are we even talking about the same thing? So we set out on a research project to look into how the reform was being defined in policy and practice. And our study was guided by three research questions. How is competency-based learning defined in state and district level policies in the region? How is competency defined at the state and district level? What are the requirements for attaining competency that lead to credit toward graduation? What are the perceived barriers and facilitators for implementation at the district and state level? So really our goal was to explore policies and practices to see how this reform was being defined and what were some of the challenges in implementing the reform. So the first thing we did was we conducted a review of state level policy in all seven states in the region. And then we worked very closely with our alliance members to identify the states where we should conduct interviews. We knew we could focus on just three states in the region. And if we could conduct interviews there, we'd get a sense of how it was being defined in practice. So members helped us select Maine, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island. And we chose these states because they really represented the range of state level policy in the region based on that uh, seven state review that we had done. So in Maine, competency-based learning was required, but districts could define the reform. Uh, Rhode Island, districts must implement the reform, but the state had some requirements that districts had to meet when implementing competency-based learning. And as I said, Massachusetts had no requirement, but districts could implement this, and they could define it how they wanted. Selecting just three states, as you can imagine, was very tough, uh, because other states in the region were doing interesting things as well. In particular, New Hampshire has been doing a lot with competency-based learning for quite some time, as you'll soon hear about from Paul. In talking with our alliance members, though, we decided that our next study, which we're working on now, would focus on New Hampshire. It's a much deeper dive into what competency-based learning looks like. So once we selected the states, we then selected and interviewed administrators at the state level in each of the three states, along with administrators at the district and sometimes the school level. It made, sometimes it made more sense to interview someone at a school rather than a district. We conducted a total of 20 interviews across Maine, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island, including six interviews with state level administrators, 11 interviews with district level administrators and three interviews with school level administrators. And you can see here, too, that we conducted policy reviews for all 14 districts and schools that were included in the study as well. So in terms of findings, uh, from the review of the state level policies, we found that five out of the seven states in the region had state legislation in place, either mandating or allowing districts to implement competency-based learning. In, and we talked a little bit about this. In Maine, New Hampshire, and Rhode Island, districts were required to implement competency-based learning. Rhode Island, it's been mandatory since 2003. In New Hampshire, all districts must implement competency-based learning K through 12 by 2017. And in Maine, districts must implement competency-based learning by 2018 or 2020 if a district applies for an extension. In Connecticut and Vermont, legislation was recently passed that supports competency-based learning but does not require districts to adopt the reform. In Massachusetts, as I said earlier, there is no policy that mandates this, but there's also nothing that restricts districts from implementing the reform. In most states, aside from Rhode Island, it's really up to the districts to define and implement competency-based learning as they deem fit. And you can see here, too, the different terms that are used across the states, as I alluded to earlier, from standards-based diploma in Maine to proficiency-based learning in Rhode Island, Vermont, and Massachusetts, mastery-based learning in Connecticut, and competency-based learning in New Hampshire. And part of the reason for the different terms is the history of policy in each of these states. So for example, um, in Connecticut, there was a previous ed reform movement where proficiency defined the lowest bar that students had to meet to pass. They didn't want the two reforms to be confused with one another. In terms of how competency-based learning was defined, we found four common elements. What was interesting was that across the policies and interviews, there was often a common language about these elements, but there was a broad range in terms of how these elements were being defined in practice. 
a broad range of approaches to each of these elements. One common element was that students must demonstrate mastery of all required competencies to earn credit or graduate. Implicit in this is the need to establish assessment and grading policies that measure student progress toward mastery in each of those competencies. In practice, there was a variety of ways in which competencies were defined and different approaches to assessment and grading. So for example, competencies were not always limited to academic content. Some also included separate competencies related to learning skills, such as taking responsibility for your own learning, persistence, and other non-academic factors, quote unquote, that we've heard so much about related to learning. Some had school-wide competencies. Others had competencies specific to courses. Some had both. Administrators reported that ensuring that students demonstrate mastery of all required competencies often necessitated changes to assessment and grading practices so that all assessments and grades were really a true measure of student progression toward a competency. So in some cases, this really meant ending practices that gave students credit or extra credit for things like neatness and turning in assignments on time, things that might be important but not necessarily a measure of whether students had mastered a competency. Really being very targeted with each of your assessments to be sure it was measuring what it ought to measure was something that a lot of districts talked about having to change in terms of their practice. Grading practices really varied across the districts, and many were still trying to figure this out. Uh, several had adopted or were in the process of implementing standards-based grading at the high school level because they felt that better matched a competency-based approach. So another common element was that students advance once they've demonstrated mastery. And students can receive more time and possibly personalized instruction to demonstrate mastery if needed. So in practice, Student advancement based on demonstrating mastery sometimes meant that students could start the next lesson or next unit within a class. Other times, students were placed in classes based on their level of understanding rather than their quote unquote grade level. So in two sites, a student could be in a ninth grade English class, for example, and an 11th grade math class. So there was really a range of practices there. In order to allow students to move through the curriculum at their own pace, several districts made changes to their schedules. So for example, one school moved to a 12-week term so that students could move more quickly through the material if needed, or they could repeat classes if needed. Another district instituted what they called intensive weeks, where the traditional schedule was replaced for one week in the fall and one week in the spring so that students who were proficient in all of their competencies could engage in enrichment intensive mini courses. And students who were not proficient had an additional week with extra staff support to help get them toward mastery. In addition, a lot of districts were really relying on online courses to help provide students with additional enrichment and additional support opportunities. So a third common element was that students are assessed using multiple measures to determine mastery. And usually, these assessments require that students apply their knowledge, not just repeat facts. Districts and schools that participated in this study reported a variety of assessment strategies that students could use to demonstrate mastery, including comprehensive course assessments, common tasks in each class, and performance tasks such as graduation portfolios and internship projects. The vast majority of schools and districts in this study were using some form of performance-based assessment as one of the multiple measures for determining student mastery. Some administrators reported that students uh, were required to have multiple assessments of mastery for each competency. In other districts or schools, students could choose among different types of assessment. The role of standardized tests in graduation requirements was really mixed and somewhat contentious across the states. Um, and it was something that many states were still grappling with. Um, so just two examples here. In Rhode Island, districts are required to move to competency-based learning. And the state also requires students to pass a standardized testing requirement. They have to meet a minimum score. Given that there are strict time frames when students are allowed to take the standardized exam, some really believed that this was antithetical to a competency approach where students are assessed when they're ready. In New Hampshire, 
They're piloting local teacher-created performance-based assessments and recently received permission from the U.S. Department of Education to have these count toward their statewide accountability and have students take the standardized tests a minimum of three times uh, throughout their K-12 schooling career. This is the PACE program that Paul is going to speak in much greater detail about in just a few minutes. Um, but it really helps demonstrate the range of how states were dealing with this issue of standardized tests. And I think New Hampshire stands out because they're the first ones to move in this direction. So a final common element was that students can learn or can earn credit toward graduation in ways other than seat time, in ways other than being in a traditional brick and mortar classroom. So this included apprenticeships, blended learning, dual enrollment, career and technical education programs, and other learning opportunities outside the traditional classroom setting. Administrators reported that having such learning opportunities available to students required having multiple pathways toward graduation and varied options for demonstrating mastery of competencies while maintaining the same expectations and rigor across these learning experiences. And that was something that they said was a real challenge and something that they were still grappling with or struggling with. In practice, state and district administrators said that moving away from seat time and credit requirements to multiple pathways toward graduation was really the goal. But interestingly, 11 out of the 14 sites were, that were implementing competency-based learning in our study, uh, they were also using credits as graduation requirements. So and even though their state policies didn't really stipulate a credit requirement. So this really indicates that moving away from a credit-based system is, is very difficult. So in addition to looking at how this was being defined, we also asked administrators, you know, what were some of the complications in implementing the reform? Where was additional support needed? So administrators discussed the need to very clearly communicate what the reform is and how it works not only to the school community, including students, their families, teachers, local businesses, but also to wider audiences, including higher education. This reform can have huge implications for college applications, and this was often where districts and schools faced the largest resistance. Students and families who were concerned about post-secondary implications, so for example, how would a competency-based report card be received in the college admissions process and in granting scholarships? State administrators said that they also had to clearly communicate um, to districts, one, that they actually can move to this model, especially in states where it's not a requirement, and two, how they can implement competency-based learning. Several state administrators noted that it is not enough for states to allow districts and schools the flexibility to implement this type of reform. Even when districts or schools do adopt competency-based learning, they don't always take advantage of the flexibility the reform can offer. As my previous example demonstrates, many sites in the study were still using uh, credit requirements to determine graduation eligibility, even though they didn't have to. So a push, they said, is really needed from school leaders, either by the state, the school board, district, or school leadership to really initiate the move to a competency-based approach. Another need that was mentioned frequently was ongoing support for teachers, including professional development and time for collaboration. Where you have students moving at their own pace or when they've demonstrated mastery, then you need a curriculum that is not only focused on the competencies, but is really designed to allow students to move through the material at their own pace. And you also need high quality assessments that help determine when students have mastered the material. Most of the administrators we interviewed said that critical to implementation of this reform were teacher leadership teams and really allocating time for teachers to collaborate so that they could develop clarity about the competencies, shared expectations, and then align the curriculum and assessments to those competencies. And this took a tremendous amount of time and dedication. Teachers may also need professional development on new assessments and new instructional practice practices so that they have the tools needed to meet the learning needs of their students in a competency-based approach. Related, administrators discussed this real need for a culture shift among students so that students are really taking ownership of their own academic success. And this is something that might not always happen in a traditional system um, and is certainly a very different approach than students might be used to. So teachers need tools to motivate students, and that might be another area for professional development. 
There was, finally, there was also talk of need for more research and models to help guide districts in their implementation and ongoing efforts. Research that provides detailed accounts of assessment and curricular structures, scheduling and other policy changes, and communication efforts is needed to provide valuable resource for resources for districts as they seek to implement a competency-based approach. Learning from others, they reported, was key, especially in such a complex reform. Administrators also identified the need for empirical research on the outcomes of co competency-based learning, most notably uh, student learning outcomes. They said that this could go a long way in helping build support for the reform. So that very quickly um, is some of the major findings of this study. As I said, further information about the studies in the report that you can access below. Um, thanks again so much for inviting me. This was really a, a fun project to work on. And we learned a lot. And I hope uh, this presentation was helpful, was helpful to you as well. Thank you, Aubrey. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really great to hear about everything, a great overview of what's going on in the region and to get a sort of sense of uh, how states in, in the region are defining this and what's playing out in different districts. Um, you've definitely uh, garnered some questions about um, this study. I think there's a, a, lot, a lot of questions that, that around this area. So I'm just going to start with one topic that we haven't discussed a lot, which talks about a question about educator evaluations. Um, and the question is, how do these districts use competency-based learning and assessments to measure growth for inclusion and in, in educator evaluation? Um, and they sort of asked a little bit more, you know, with everything else on teachers' plates, how are they finding time? You know, do you have anything about standardized assessments and evaluations? I don't know if there's anything um, that you found that you could address about that. I'm trying to think. It, um, it didn't come up necessarily in this study. It's a question that we've asked in our next case study project is, we know that competency-based learning is coming down the pike at the same time as Common Core and teacher evaluation systems and changes in the standardized exam. Um, so that's something that's actually a research question for our study that we're working on now, uh, in part because when we did this study, we heard a lot from administrators who said, you know, we're trying to do this all at the same time. And um, one of the things that administrators talked about doing was really trying to streamline them and see where there was overlap. Uh, they didn't talk in particular about teacher evaluation systems and how that was working, I think in part because they were still trying to figure that out. Um, but certainly, the Common Core, they were able to wrap that into their competencies. Um, and I think as they were developing their competencies and as they were developing assessments, there was a real push from the administrators that we talked to um, to try and streamline this into other education initiatives that they that were coming at them. Um, I, again, time, you know, every ed reform needs time, but I mean that was one of the things that they said was helpful too, was having enough time to really think through where the overlap was. I'm not sure if that directly answers the question. Hopefully it gives some insight. Thanks, Aubrey. Yeah, I think, you know, as you mentioned, there are a lot of reforms, and as people have mentioned in the chat, it's not only time, but having a support system in place to you know, work this with these new initiatives, I think, is also important. Um, just switching gears a little bit to another question that came up about uh, how this system affects students with disabilities. And I, I guess I wonder, in terms of uh, you know, the equity issue around this initiative, and if there were anything you found about not only students with disabilities, but other struggling students uh, that you could talk about. Yeah, and I know um, Jobs for the Future has a report out that um, looks directly at this. Um, I'll see if I can find the link to it um, and, and post that in there. Um, but that's a real question, I think, um, is how do we really ensure that this reform is doing what it's intended to do? Every, most of the administrators we talked to said that one of the main reasons they were doing this was because they could see that students were really still slipping through the cracks despite their best efforts. So if you could move to a model where you're really focused on where students are and giving them the flexibility of time to master those competencies, those key skills, those, that key content, then maybe we could meet their needs better. Um, and so that was really, we didn't delve in too much in terms of how that was happening because it wasn't one of the main research questions for this study, unfortunately. Again, it was the one that came up and we were like, oh, we should put that in our next study. Um, so that's definitely something that we're um, looking to. But that Jobs for the Future study did a really nice job. Oh, and I think um, 
Josh already posted it, did a really nice job talking about that. And I know they addressed it head on. So I, I, I would definitely check that out and say that it's, it was a key motivator for districts and schools in implementing this reform was to try and meet the needs of their students with special needs. A lot of them were trying to meet uh, their needs of English language learners and new American students. If you could allow them more time, you know, that giving them time to really master the language would be helpful, uh, was what we heard from a couple of administrators as well. Thanks. And we have a sort of a follow-up question about um, the equity issue is uh, related to, you know, are there other elements of CBE that, you're, that you found in the site that are creating problems or new problems for serving underserved students, you know, that maybe hadn't been, you know, you know new issues that are arising with this new initiative? I think the motivation key, or the motivation piece, is key. Um, teachers were struggling with, you know, this is a whole new model, and so you're dealing with students who are used to one way of doing school, and students are really, really good at gaming the system <laughs> and finding the holes. Um, so, you know, what they really, what they really needed were new motivation strategies. Um, you can't be marking students, for example, off if they're late. Well, then how do you make sure they're on time? And part of that is making sure that the, that the learning that they're doing is really engaging. And that was certainly one way that districts were trying to motivate students. But they felt like they needed more tools. So I think um, that was something that kind of caught them a little off guard. Um, and something that they could see as a real need was finding different ways to motivate students in this approach especially those students who were struggling, it might be difficult. You know, if it was difficult to motivate them already, then it, you know, how do you get them on board with this new approach? Um, but there's certainly a lot of success stories out there of, of districts that have been able to do this. Um, so it's, it's really an issue of trying to learn from one another, I think. Thanks, Aubrey. Yeah, I'm going to follow up with one question that we received upon registration. And I think we have time for probably one or two more questions, and then there will be some time again at the end um, to ask some questions. Uh, and asked about something, it says, can mastery-based education also address, facilitate the learning of soft skills, such as perseverance, communication, teamwork, et cetera? I know you were just addressing that in terms of you know, students showing up or doing their homework. Can you talk a little bit more about uh, anything that was talked about when you spoke to districts about those soft skills? Yeah, definitely. This was, those were often the school-wide competencies that were being implemented at a lot of the districts. So as I talked about, you had very different competencies. Some were really just focused on academics. Some were tied to the course. Some were school-wide. Some districts had both course-tied or course-specific competencies. Some had school-wide competencies in addition. That's where we really saw those soft, quote unquote soft skills um, that were coming through. And that was grading was kind of an issue there, too, because if you were grading it across classes, you were really having to get teachers to coordinate their efforts. And how we've got to give one grade for communication. We've got to give one grade for attendance and participation. Um, so it was, administrators talked how it was a neat way to collaborate among teachers in ways that they hadn't collaborated before. But then you also had to create structures so that they could do that. Um, and when it, where it was a school-wide competency, you could have each teacher really you know, hammering home the same message. Administrators found that really powerful. It was also key, though, to make sure that you had a lot of clarity around what those soft skills meant and what were some of the indicators that students had mastered that soft skill. So there was a lot of background discussion among teachers and staff to really figure out you know, what, what soft skills were important, what they look like, how do we assess them, and, and, and how do we promote them among students, and in a lot of cases, how do we teach them? Um, I think those were some of the main issues that came up when we were talking about them. Thank you. Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of great answers, and I think, you know, the study definitely raised a lot of questions, but I want to thank you very much for sharing your initial findings with us today. And as Aubrey mentioned, um, the report is available for download, you can see in um, download today's files, and um, Aubrey will be available for questions um, at the end. So thank you, Aubrey. And we're going to um, move on to our second keynote presentation today, um, which is 
uh, Paul Lather, who's the Deputy Commissioner from the New Hampshire Department of Education, who will be talking about a specific implementation in New Hampshire about the PACE program. So Paul, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to get right to it and share our pilot, the New Hampshire PACE, or Performance Assessment of Competency Education with you all in the next few minutes. Uh, know that there isn't time to share all of the history of competency education in New Hampshire, but I do want to share some thoughts as to where we are today that underpin our New Hampshire PACE pilot. Here's a big picture look, if you will, at how we think about competencies in New Hampshire put together by our eminent competency consultant, Rose Colby. When we think of a system of competency education, we think of competencies that are tied to standards and expressing a continuum of learning mapped developmentally across K through 12, and in some cases on into higher education and beyond. The expectation that students are deeply engaged in project-based learning, where formative assessments are ongoing and lead to summative performance assessments. They were aimed at higher depth of knowledge so that students can actually use knowledge strategically and in solving problems and understanding the world. That students have personalized plans and systemic supports to address where he or she is in their developmental trajectory of learning. And that there is personalization of curriculum through projects and learning studios in order to give uh, students an opportunity to deeply engage in their work. And all of this supported by a new system of grading based on a deeper understanding on the part of teachers and learning communities of the purposes of formative and summative assessments, where competence is commonly and consistently understood, and also where students are afforded opportunities to reach competence if they do not make it, perhaps, in the first time. This supports uh, New Hampshire's theory of action, which is consistent with uh, uh, what Jean Wilhoyd and Linda Darling-Hammond and uh, Linda Pittenger of the uh, uh, Center for Innovation and Education wrote in what's referred to as the 51st State Paper, uh, where we see a system of personalized learning that uh, was uh, developed, if you will, um, to have clear and high expectations delivered through a competency-based course of study that is built around customized pathways designed to adapt to a student's learning, where we have developed comprehensive systems of support in schools and districts for all students, and we have truly built out anytime, anywhere learning in our communities and established an unrelenting focus on student agency to define the process all aimed at college and career success after graduation. In thinking about accountability with this kind of teaching and learning system, we needed to move well beyond the structures we are all perhaps too familiar with under No Child Left Behind, as well as the race to the top college and career readiness focus uh, of the last uh, several years, and the first round of uh, state waivers and then the state waiver renewals. We really needed to look to a new kind of accountability, which we are calling Accountability 3.0, which looks at a much wider array of measures to help us get a deeper understanding of college and career success, one that supports shifts in teaching and learning to a system that is more personalized, competency and project-based, and one that more directly balances formative and summative assessments around a student-centered approach as opposed to a top-down standards-driven system. In the 51st state paper that I referred to earlier, Linda, Jean, and Linda talk about a continuous improvement and innovation model that focuses on richer, deeper learning, which requires a very substantial emphasis on the development of professional uh, uh, capacity to support this learning, and the need, of course, for resources and really a sense of co-responsibility around the delivery and availability of resources at every level of the system. Here's a picture of the 51st state accountability system, where both locally derived assessments in New Hampshire, that is local performance assessments, and other assessments to use uh, that are used to determine student mastery of competencies 
are combined with state level checks at grade spans. In New Hampshire, we use the Smarter Balanced Assessment for those state level checks and further checked through uh, both paper and on-site quality reviews by peers and experts to ensure reliability and validity in the system. New Hampshire based its PACE system on all of this national thinking, and then we took it one step further. We believe that one of the core problems in current accountability systems is that the external nature of the top-down standards state assessments approach essentially disempowers local educators from the design and measurement of their own system of education. We think that by giving back some of that authority for design and measurement, that we are creating a co-responsibility system that has the potential for taking us much further over time. The thinking is really based on some of Dick Elmore's thinking about reciprocality connected to his construct, the instructional core, and the notion of accountability altogether. If I expect performance from you, I must provide you with the opportunity to meet the mark. And if both you and I invest in uh, both student and educator's skill and knowledge, then both students and educators will have a reciprocal responsibility to demonstrate their learning and deeper learning over time. In tune with this, we have envisioned a system where local educators design their theory of action around teaching and learning. They tell us how they intend to assess that learning and how they will hold themselves accountable. And we at the state level then will check and verify this system and will also be involved in comprehensive support systems to both improve and transform the system over time. Here are the partners of the New Hampshire PACE pilot. We all sit around a common PACE policy table at least once a month, and so far by doing this, we have been able to construct the system together going forward. As of last week, this slide needs to be updated. The districts in the lighter shades have now fully, enjoy, uh, fully joined us. We've had a three-day New Hampshire PACE summer summit and need now to be recognizing that all of the uh, members are fully and equally at the table. I also thought it might be uh, instructive to share with you a little of the timeline for approval of the New Hampshire PACE pilot with the U.S. Department of Education. We first met with the Secretary in 2012. After that meeting, we realized we were not actually ready to implement a wholly new system. We had not constructed the elements of the system, nor had we prepared our partners at the local, state, or the national level. A full two years later, we did finally meet again with the Secretary, where he gave us the verbal go-ahead to move forward with a pilot with close guidance by then Assistant Secretary Deborah Delisle and her staff. On March 3rd of this year, we received our uh, official approval. We were able to do this, however, because after that first meeting several years ago, we constructed our system, provided deep professional learning opportunities for our educators, and we designed and actually began to implement the new system even before we received the final approval. The final approval really just allowed us to move beyond the annual state uh, assessments to grade span state assessments, and our hearty band of the initial four implementing districts were hell-bent to make this happen whether we were approved or not. Please note that this may sound like a smooth and easy process, but know that it wasn't. Even today, it does feel a little like Sisyphus pushing the boulder back up the mountain. All along the way, we had local folks on our team with us, as well as key national supporters as well. And even then, in our September 2014 meeting with the Secretary, we encountered strong doubt that we could actually accomplish what we had set out to do. So to counter this concern, we emphasized our message of a locally constructed co-responsibility system, that it is through the deep engagement, energy, and work provided by our local partners that this can and will be done. And it is through this design that we can better support deeper student learning at the instructional core. We shared the plans and thoughts of our local leaders. The Curriculum and Assessment Administrator for the Sanborn Regional New Hampshire School District, Ellen Hume Howard, 
was particularly articulate in our meeting with the secretary as to all of the planning and work the district had put into the pilot in the system. After hearing this, both uh, Secretary Duncan and Assistant Secretary Delisle agreed in principle to the concept of our pilot and said if others did this kind of legwork, it would really make it a lot easier for the department to support innovative practices. Here are some of the core design principles of, of the pilot. We wanted to balance the key issues of transparency and accountability with reciprocal responsibility in terms of resource commitment and support for leadership and educator capacity. All of these design principles are necessary as we move forward in building the system and are really prerequisites, if you will, to joining the pilot. We did this by being clear that there are certain prerequisites that uh, we have come to call guardrails for approval and entry into the system. In the case of New Hampshire PACE, districts needed to assure that they have common competencies in place, a competency-based instructional design, performance assessments that can and will be validated, and an agreement to continue to give the large-scale state assessment and grade spans, elementary, middle, and high. Here's the agreed-upon schedule for assessments that was approved by the U.S. Department of Education in March of this year. Common PACE performance assessments are assessments that were developed by local educators and uh, really embedded in curriculum at the local level and agreed upon as a common assessment given across the participating districts by content area and by grade. As you can see, we ha are still transitioning to a fully uh, competency-based system, but remember, we, are, we do exist under the current uh, legislation of No Child Left Behind and the amendments. And so we had to construct this in a way that was understandable by folks in the previous system. Meanwhile, we have worked with national and state partners to develop and deepen our performance assessment task bank. We were at first concerned that we would not have a deep enough task bank to meet the expectations of the pilot. But between October of 2014 and now, really less than a year, the four PACE implementing districts alone have produced between 140 and 160 performance assessments in all three content areas. If we have had a problem, it has been really vetting each of these tasks for the technical quality requirements that we believe need to be included in the pilot in a timely fashion so that we can address the questions that we know will come both nationally and from the U.S. Department of Education. Additionally, we have thought very deeply about how to scale this project. Right now, we have eight implementing districts. We've already uh, doubled our size from the original four, which is about 8 to 10% of our state's student population. Also this summer, we have let an invitation for additional districts to join the PACE project in one of three tiers. Tier 1, which would be implementing this year, and that we have closed at the, at the eight that I just mentioned. Tier 2, which would be for districts that have competencies K through 12 that they are implementing in the classroom but need intensive professional development in building and implementing performance assessments. These districts would possibly be implementing in the following year if all goes well and they feel like they're ready to go forward. Tier 3 is for districts that need to build competencies and implementation practices. They most likely will not be implementing the PACE accountability system for several years until they've been able to build out their system and have their educators feel comfortable moving forward. At the same time, we have constructed a system for examining practice and learning, which includes both student work reviews by peers and expert on-site reviews tied to a deep review of student performance. A review of the first year's performance tasks this summer by all of the participating districts, as well as expert panel uh, members, really gave us rich information for implementation uh, this coming year. We hope that our performance assessments will improve and build, uh, get stronger as we go forward and our educators become more comfortable uh, uh, working within such a system. There was a question earlier about uh, 
the relationship to uh, educator effectiveness and educator evaluation. I wanted to share with you how we are looking at student data in a competency education environment for these purposes. Our student learning objectives are essentially made up of the results of aggregate student work, as you can see in the green boxes here, tied to student performance on performance and other assessments. Essentially, educators are held accountable in such a system to students' demonstration of competency attainment on an aggregate level, and the whole system is tied together. The Center for Assessment, Scott Marion and others have really helped us build out this system to be as coherent as possible as we've gone and uh, put it together. As I mentioned earlier, Ellen Hume Howard of uh, the Sanborn Regional District has been a strong local leader of this effort. Here is a PACE wordle that she constructed, which hopefully you see constitutes our hopes for a full state implementation of New Hampshire PACE, but one that is made up of state and local partners and a system that has been constructed by all of the participants, one that is truly owned by us all. Now I'm going to stop there, although I have some time left. I'm sure there are many questions. Um, I did want to, uh, if it's OK, uh, uh, Jessica, address one question that came up uh, initially in, as people uh, uh, signed on, and that had to do with um, the issue of comparability. Um, how can a state ensure some consistency with regard to policy and practice across districts if implementation is left to a local option decision? And I, I guess the thing that I would like to share is that part of our pilot is being able to demonstrate that we can build consistent and comparable annual determinations of student proficiency and, and competence, whether we're using a multiple measure uh, accountability system or we're using the large scale state assessment system. So we are doing studies back and forth uh, between the districts that are involved in the PACE pilot versus how uh, uh, those districts have performed in previous years, as well as in comparison to uh, districts that are not involved in the PACE uh, performance uh, assessment project, uh, but of similar uh, background and uh, similar uh, uh, student uh, demographics and, and other uh, factors. So um, that is actually what the PACE pilot is about. We, of course, would not be able to build a system of accountability where folks join and become a part of the effort as they become ready without having an accountability system that is available for all uh, districts regardless of their participation and pace. So this, this pilot is really to demonstrate that such an idea is possible. And I'll stop there. Great. Thank you so much, Paul, for a great presentation and, you know, really talking about the history and what's been involved in this. I think it's been great to see how it's, you know, you're adding additional districts this year. And you've definitely um, raised, piqued a lot of interest in some questions, so I'm going to take a couple of questions um, from the chat. And one was um, already answered, but I wanted to talk a little bit more about the task bank. And someone asked if you can give a little bit more information on the task bank and is this resource available to any state and what grades or subjects does it include? Um, the, the content areas included in the task bank are English language arts, math, and science. Uh, we are embedding uh, what we call work-study practices, or uh, what many folks are now calling success skills, into those assessments. Uh, we have not included them as part of the, the grading of the, the assessments yet, but they are embedded and we are studying that, that uh, a part of, of the work. And uh, they are grades uh, uh, 3 through um, 11. Great. Thank you. Um, another question about someone asked comparing and contrasting New Hampshire system with similar systems that were instituted in Nebraska and Kentucky, and Kentucky. I don't know if you're familiar with them pre-NCLB and about what lessons did you learn. I don't know if, what your familiarity is with those. Well, in, in talking to, to folks like Gene Wilhoyt and others who were uh, at least involved in the Kentucky experience, what we learned is that uh, we certainly needed to uh, uh, set up a system with partners that could um, 
really advise us on issues of technical quality. We also learned that we needed to involve educators right from the very beginning from the, uh, in terms of the overall design of not just the actual assessments, but the design of the system altogether. Um, we also learned that communication is essential, uh, and we are learning every day how important communication is. Um, and as much as we thought we were prepared for uh, the issues around communication, when you start to attach the kinds of stakes that an accountability system have in, in terms of uh, public education, you can't be too prepared for the issue of communication. And that's in particular, uh, I would reference um, stakeholders like legislators, like parents, like community members, uh, and the ability to communicate overall. And then lastly, um, I would also say we learned from a number of folks, including folks from Maine who also attempted to administer such a system, that um, you really have to attend to how much work uh, uh, people in the field are willing and able to put into building a new system. If, if um, all of it needs to be created and it needs to be created and it's a uh, heavy, heavy lift, all across the board and folks can't see how they're going to get from A to B, it, it becomes overwhelming. And so we felt we needed to design and, and address a number of the design factors very early on before we started on the work. And that's why it took us two years to put the system together uh, before we, we even got started in terms of accountability. Great. Thanks. Yeah, I think you know, we definitely found in, you know, this, the communication is definitely an important issue and I think one that is really important to keep in mind. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, one other question that I know is a common thing about sort of post-secondary work um, and relates to how have colleges received New Hampshire's competency-based transcripts or diploma during the college application process and what your experience has been with sort of that transition. Well, I would say um, I, I would like to give a shout out to Mark Costin from uh, the Great Schools Partnership, who I know has been on the call. Uh, the Great Schools Partnership has done a lot around uh, getting acceptance uh, at the college level um, around accepting uh, transcripts. I will say that um, uh, folks in New Hampshire have been particularly conservative around the design of transcripts. And although you noted that in 1997, when we first started this, we started with the transcript, we actually found that that's the place where um, we want to be very careful because it's one thing to talk about stakes. It's another thing to be talking about affecting a student's overall career in terms of what college they get into and all of that. So we, we have found that um, the schools that have really deeply Im implemented competency education have been careful to communicate directly with uh, colleges and universities, particularly those where a lot of their students attend, make sure that they accept um, uh, anything that looks different on the transcript, and uh, frankly may not uh, uh, entirely transition to a fully competency-based transcript. Uh, or might provide either a competency-based transcript or something that looks much more traditional depending on the college's need. And the other thing, unfortunately, that we always have to recognize is that particularly with the large land-grant institutions, they need to be able to make decisions pretty quickly, particularly on a first cut. And so you can't have you know, big, big, long, wordy uh, transcripts. You have to have information that is easily translatable. With that all said, however, uh, more and more non-traditional students are attending colleges at all levels, and uh, including homeschoolers and others. And so uh, uh, admissions folks are getting more and more adept at understanding where a student is in terms of their ability to succeed in their institution. Thanks. It's great to hear about you know the transition as you talk about where you started. I just wanted to pick up on one thing that you mentioned and. Uh, was brought up during Aubrey's presentation about um, sort of you know students with disabilities or underserved students. I'm wondering how how the PACE program is imp impacting that. Any issues you've discovered, or what challenges or improvements it's making for those groups? Well, um, the challenge of addressing students um, uh, who have have uh, 
uh, particular limitations to educational uh, uh, gain and, and growth. Uh, don't go away with competency education. But I, the thing I, I guess we all would say um, who are involved deeply in this is at least you know where a student is and you can really focus on where they are and what they need to show growth. And so a competency uh, sy uh, system really needs to be personalized to a student's needs. It needs to have full um, uh, support um, so that a student who, who needs greater support will have that. that that's, a, that's really where some of this conversation around a reciprocal education process is. I think where the challenge comes down to, and I think we don't, any of us have answers to, is so what happens if a student really falls behind and is not showing the kind of growth? And you have a system that is no longer uh, cohort driven, where students are moving along whether they are demonstrating mastery or not. over time. So it's really going to be more evident that students are not gaining if a, if a, a mastery or a competency-based uh, system is actually put in place. Um, I think we have a lot to learn about how to support particularly our most challenged students. I think that um, what we are finding is that the more we personalize the methodologies of learning, uh, the anytime, anyplace, anywhere learning, uh, the individualized pace and individualized support for learning, the more students we know and find are succeeding in learning and succeeding in education uh, going beyond uh, high school. That's been our experience. We've seen many more students graduate, many more students not drop out, many more students find a pathway to success either in post-secondary uh, or in uh, the community and in careers. So um, we feel pretty comfortable that that's demonstrable and we have some data that will, will support that, but I think the jury is out as to how it's done and how it's scaled over time. Great, thanks. Yeah, it's definitely um, you know, great to hear about you know, how it's impacting all those students. We have time for about one or two more questions, and Paul, again, will be available at the end um, for some additional questions. So thank you for all that have been posed so far. Uh, I want to go to a question that was just posed that asked, if competency is individualized, is the assessment also individualized? Um, in our system, as of now, it is not. Um, we have common performance assessments as we're, we are very much concerned about being able to demonstrate comparability in a different way. Um, we really wanted to demonstrate that you could have an accountability system that was not based on a single large-scale state assessment, but could be based on um, perhaps deeper assessments that are closer to the learning process and closer to embedded uh, being embedded in uh, curriculum and, and learning. We, we haven't taken it to the point of individualized, non-common assessments. We think that might be the next step. Um, if that were to happen, and uh, part of our hope and intent for PACE is that we build it in, that, we'll, that it will be built in as, as a part of a, uh, a system of, of multiple assessments, some of which are common and some of which are non-common, but much closer to uh, an individual student's true learning path and their interests in education. Great. Thanks, Paul. It's great to hear about sort of where you've been and where you're going. So I'm going to, um, Paul, thank you again for a great presentation. And um, please feel free to post your questions, and we'll have some time again at the end. I'm going to take this opportunity to uh, move the presentation over and to uh, Julia Freeland, who is our discussant today. Again, she's a research fellow at the Clayton Christensen Institute and is well-versed in New Hampshire as well as competency-based learning. So um, we're happy to have you here today, Julia. Great. Thanks so much, Jessica. Um, so first off, I want to thank Aub Aubrey and Paul. Um, Aubrey, first off, it's wonderful to have a snapshot that we can compare across states that many of us hear about on a one-off basis, but great that you're keeping us honest in terms of where each of those states actually is in terms of policy and practice. Um, and Paul, who I've had the great honor of working with closely in my own research, 
uh, you refer to yourself as Sisyphus, but I have to say from the outside, um, you're only making progress for a national movement and your decades of work to get to this place shouldn't be underestimated. Um, and we'll often talk about sort of in the Comsey-based community how much if, if each state had a Paul Leather, uh, some of the states that we're looking at today might, might look quite different. Um, so I want to take, take the next few minutes just to talk about two reactions to what we've heard about today from Aubrey and Paul. First, I want to discuss why it is that Comsey-based education can be really difficult to study and evaluate. And then I want to pivot sort of relatedly to looking at where policy um, either helps or hurts that effort. Um, so I, as, as Jessica mentioned, I spent um, about a year and a half looking at competency-based practice in New Hampshire. Specifically, I went in with the research question of how blended learning was or wasn't helping to effectuate sort of the implementation of competency-based pathways. But I came out um, very much echoing a lot of Aubrey's findings across the Northeast, which is that competency-based education is not sort of one thing. Um, and I think that when we talk about competency-based education as a thing that exists in the world that we can point to and study, we're really underestimating the fact that at this stage in practice, competency-based education is in fact a dynamic collection of philosophies, policies, and practices. And that although we on this call and others in the field may use this term, we're actually all getting behind slightly different visions of this thing called competency-based education. Now, what's troubling about this, um, and, about, and somewhat about Aubrey's findings, is that from a reform perspective, it means that rhetoric can get way out ahead of practice um, in a way that the movement and the ideas could lose credibility. Um, that's, again, why I think Paul's work is really important, because it's real, it's tangible, it exists out there. Um, but in other states that are sort of toying with the idea of competency-based education, or even states like Aubrey mentioned, like Rhode Island, where we have competency-based or proficiency-based education on the books, um, if it's not actually happening in practice, it's going to be interpreted as yet another fad or another quote-unquote intervention that doesn't have teeth. Um, and I argue that this, ha this is happening in part because this term is so capacious and also in part because as it's gained steam in the reform conversation, various camps that sort of pre-existed competency-based have come to the table and have sort of put their own individual stamp on this concept. So what are some of those camps? Now, I'm not sort of trying to pit these against one another. They're not mutually exclusive. But they're actually uh, um, distinct philosophies about what the delivery of education should look like and what the goal is. So one camp, and this is personally what the Christensen Institute sort of st our starting point was, is around blended learning. So as technology has sort of made its way into classrooms and integrated its way into instruction, you have a lot of ed tech champions who see technology as a way to unlock pacing. And they see competency-based education as the sort of framework or philosophy that, that unlocks us, again, from seat time and from credit hours and the policy that would allow their tools to sort of effectually uh, personalize learning for each student. You also have another camp of folks who have been for many decades calling for deeper learning, right, who think that assessment should be more personalized, that we should not just sort of lay low at the lowest levels of Bloom's taxonomy, but that we really have to ensure that students are able to show what they know and are able to sort of dig in on concepts, not just uh, demonstrate mastery via rote memorization. And we also have, obviously, the standards-based camp, which, again, not at odds with those last two that I named, but, but have slightly different goals in mind, which is to say that if we can actually ensure that students have mastered every single standard that we've articulated, will we be producing students who are college career ready and is competency-based um, as, a, as a sort of pathway, the way to get there? And lastly, I think we have champions of assessment reform who often sort of uh, hang out with the deeper learning folks, as Paul alluded to, but who have long been calling for new assessment paradigms. Um, and I think it's not a coincidence that New Hampshire has pivoted to really focusing on this last bucket, as, as I've come to think that new assessment paradigms really sit at the fulcrum of a competency-based system. But this can mean a lot of things. This can mean really pivoting to performance assessments. It could also mean uh, building a system of more frequent formative assessments on demand rather than lockstep with one-size-fits-all pacing guides. 
So that's just a taste of, of, I think, a variety of camps that have all come to this table, and we're all nodding our heads that competency-based education is likely a good thing for students and is likely going to push the system towards deeper learning, towards flexible pacing, towards all the things that we sort of um, put under the competency-based umbrella. But as you can guess, then, competency-based approaches on the ground are going to look vastly different from one another. Additionally, we're seeing one level down from just those philosophical differences that some of the classroom strategies that we're recruiting into competency-based systems are not necessarily new, but are being recast in this, under this new name. Um, so you see schools doing blended learning. You see folks focusing on just-in-time supports and RTI. You also see schools that are sort of um, really focusing on project-based learning, all calling this competency-based education. And the problem with that is, A, it's really hard to study as a sort of, and compare across schools, but B, this also opens the door in some states who are legislating around competency-based education for schools to continue doing business as usual and just call it something different. Um, I think Aubrey sort of alluded to that uh, in terms of the states that have, have proposed mandates or implemented mandates to go competency or proficiency-based but where, um, as you and I probably know, a lot of classrooms in those states still look quite traditional. So what's a way forward from this? Well, I think that, um, and I saw Chris Sturgis is writing a blog on, on definition, so I don't know if I want you to quote me on this, Chris, but <laughs> I'll, I'll proceed anyways. Uh, and you've heard me say this before. I think that, um, that if we spend too long sort of thinking about definitions as codified in policy or by various reform camps, we're going to be going in circles. And that the real 2.0 step, um, and Aubrey hit on this in her last slide, is to start to capture codify and study models. School models that involve various choreographies of how students move through their learning, school models that involve different delivery mechanisms. And in so doing, we can own the fact that there's variety in implementation um, but not sort of get stuck in the semantics and the, and the cycle of, of debating definitions. We can also use models as building blocks. Rather than everyone is building a whole new system from scratch, if you can codify what different competency-based models look like, then district by district you're not reinventing the wheel when you try to transition to a competency-based system. You actually have um, sort of prototypes that you can borrow from. Um, and lastly, and this will get into sort of what I think the policy implications of a model focus could be, is that if we can be candid about variation but also start to find commonalities across different school models, then at the state level, policies can align around models rather than very capacious definitions. So rather than calling everything competency-based education but seeing a lot of variation on the ground, we can actually start creating toolkits to assemble those different models. And I'd argue that Paul's first slide, um, I could go back to it, but I'm not going to. He had, his first slide had four columns, and it was attributed to Rose Colby, um, a great thinker in this space. And it, it outlined the sort of moving parts of New Hampshire's 3.0 system. And I think what he's showing us there is really a point of view on not just the different models that are going to take shape in New Hampshire, but the moving parts that the state can then provide tools around. And it's really that shift to allowing different school models to blossom in a competency-based system and providing tools to get there that I think is going to get to scale the approaches that we're right now just seeing um, mostly the ambitions of in policy. Um, lastly, models are going to allow research to really blossom because uh, rather than studying this as a quote unquote intervention, the way that typical education research tends to evaluate um, efforts on the ground, we can't study competency-based education necessarily as an A-B test because it's a paradigm shift in whole school models. However, if we codify those models, we can actually start to evaluate them against the things we care about like equity, like serving all students, like some of the values that I think have come through your questions. Now, um, quickly to turn to sort of policy, which I think was sort of at the heart of, of Paul's talk, although of course he's very much living the day-to-day -day of implementing this in New Hampshire. Um, I think that 
New Hampshire's evolution is a clear testament to the fact that seat time is not the only policy that's reinforcing time-based practices. Over the past five years or so, we've seen a huge call for seat time waivers or getting rid of seat time or eliminating the Carnegie unit. And even with that happening, of course, not, schools are not sort of instantly flipping the switch to being competency-based. And I'd hazard that that's because, in fact, attendance, funding, the school year calendar, union contracts, the hegemony of the, the summative assessment around teacher evaluation and school grading, there's all sorts of policies that are part and parcel of a time-based system that aren't necessarily credit hours. Um, there's a great paper by Maria Worthen of INACOL and Lillian Pace at KnowledgeWorks that sort of summarizes the federal obstacles to competency-based education, which go far beyond just the credit hour. But I think that what Paul's, what Paul's presentation highlighted for me was all of the other pieces of policy that have to be aligned for schools to really be willing and able to do this work of implementing competency-based education. Um, there is uh, in the current, the Every Child Achieves Act um, draft that's currently under consideration for um, the sort of debates around ESEA on the Hill right now, there's an innovative assessment pilot program um, being proposed that I think would give more states opportunities to do what Paul is doing. Um, and again, although he framed it as an assessment reform, again, if you see assessment as sort of the fulcrum of a competency-based system, I think that's a really promising approach. We're also encouraged by the fact that this is a pilot, not a waiver. Because given the spotty implementation on the ground right now, even states with competency-based policies on the books um, may not have the capacity on the ground to really be implementing competency-based pathways consistently across all their schools. So it's great to see what, what Paul has done as a model um, of picking four to eight districts who are really willing and frankly have about five years under their belt of competency-based implementation to run this pilot in a really robust way. Um, I'll just wrap up saying that you know, from spending a couple of years looking at this movement, uh, I, I think the Northeast has really led from a policy perspective. Um, and, and I think that we can take Aubrey's insights and Paul's sort of multi-year trajectory um, and groundbreaking federal work to, to translate that momentum and policy really into practice on the ground. Um, so I'll hand it back over to Jessica. I know we have Q&A for, for the whole group now, I think. Thanks, Julia. And I think you raised a lot of really important questions in a short time period. And I thank you for all your thoughtfulness and touching on a lot of the important points, I think, on models and definitions and all of that. And um, I do want to move into um, some Q&A with um, all our presenters, an opportunity for them to either ask each other questions, or we also have some questions still um, from the chat and from registration. So feel free to pose them. We still have about eight to 10 minutes left for questions. And one I just wanted to touch on is, um, you know, you, you brought up the question of models, and I don't know, someone asked about, uh, you know, what data is is out there. So, you know, to, for educators who are starting to implement this, you know, it's nice to have evidence of the success. So, if anyone can address what data is currently being used or available to support the effectiveness of competency-based learning, and it was sort of mentioned in terms of not necessarily just achievement, but less remedial courses required as college freshmen or greater preparedness for careers. So this is Julia. Um, I, I guess I'd say, you know, there's studies showing that um, allowing students to progress at their own pace is a good thing. I think my point about models is that we really haven't yet codified school models that we can study in a reliable way against the variables that we care about. Um, and, and I'm seeing Erica's question also around the idea of codifying a model-based approach. You know, I'm, I'm slightly biased here because what we've done at the Christensen Institute around blended learning is exactly this. So rather than say what we think the field should look like of blended learning, we've gone out surveyed schools that are doing blended learning and then codified what they're up to so that hopefully schools in the future don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, what that's also allowed for is larger research institutions like RAND and SRI to do um, randomized controlled trials within those models to test what's working and what's not. Um, so I think that we're, I think it's too early, um, and Paul and Aubrey may disagree, but it's too early in terms of having the right models to study to then say it is or isn't working. 
because again, that mentality has to do with sort of treating competency-based education as an intervention versus a whole school model shift. Yeah, I think I'll chime in. I, I, I agree with your last point there, Julie. I think it's really, a lot of these districts, even the ones that are really far ahead, um, including those in New Hampshire, you know, they're still working on this. Um, we've had the fortunate experience of, I've been able to talk with some of the PACE schools and you know, they're really far ahead of the game, but they still are, are working on, on different things. And so there was a point that we made in, the, in our report that the timing of when you look at, these, at the outcomes is really important because for a lot of these districts and a lot of these models that are there right now, it's a little too soon to be looking at their, their outcomes because they're still really working to implement this with fidelity across their system. So I think that's part of the struggle right now, too, is getting the timing right. Um, there's a lot of researchers that are going in there now trying to, trying to document how, what the implementation process is, too, and I think that could be a really important piece. Uh, but the timing, I think, is an issue right now. Thanks, Paul. I just want to see if um, if you want to chime in. If not, that's fine. We yeah. have other questions. But. Yeah, the only other thing I would add is that we have had a, a pretty significant investment recently to evaluate PACE. Uh, not that PACE is a fully articulated model, but it is a certain kind of model to implement um, a competency education at scale, um, at least the beginnings of one. And so uh, having that uh, comprehensive evaluation, I think, should be uh, useful. It's a two-year pilot. We expect that we'll have results sometime uh, uh, in the coming uh, year or year and a half. Great. Thanks, Paul. And I just know, don't know if you wanted to add anything. I know you answered in the chat the question about student voice and pace. If there's anything you wanted to share with everybody, I thought that was an interesting question and a good component to this process as well. Right. Well, one of the things that we spent a lot of time on last uh, week was how to increase the amount of voice and cho choice uh, for students in common PACE assessments. Uh, and uh, at one, on the one hand, we want to have a system that we can measure as being comparable, and at the same time, we want to uh, advance personalized learning uh, as much as possible, where the student has as much uh, uh, control and, and, and say in, in what they're learning and how they're designing it. And so as we build out our elements of comparability and our elements of, of distinction, if you will, between uh, one assessment and another, we, we are looking at that. I think it's important, however, to, to note that what we're trying to do isn't trying to wrap our, our, ourselves entirely around all teaching and learning. What we're trying to do is to create a, uh, an accountability system that will at least not get in the way of a personalized, student-centered, competency-based uh, uh, learning system, uh, and that will hopefully be supportive of it. The issue of voice and choice, I think, is the tricky, the tricky part of this, and so we're working on it. And uh, I, I appreciate the question, and I appreciate the uh, the fact that we have to continue to uh, provide focus in this area. Thanks, Paul. And I know we've had a couple questions on a different topic about adaptive assessments and fitting into um, competency-based learning. I don't know if someone wants to address that as well. Um, this is Julia. So I, I think Chris's answer, Chris Sturgis's answer sort of got to this, but um, you know, we think of adapt adaptive assessment as, as very much formative, right? So a student can be online um, working through uh, an individual learning pathway that adapts um, as they go. And that's obviously very much um, competency or mastery based in, in the narrowest sense of the word, right? It's allowing you to move through material at your own pace. I think that what we're seeing in a lot of schools is that it's sort of both and, that you might use an adaptive software program to ensure that students are progressing along at a pace appropriate to their needs and strengths, but that you'll also have deeper learning experiences either in a project-based capacity or, or a performance assessment opportunity or capstone project where students are forced to go deeper um, and to demonstrate what they know beyond just recall within that adaptive 
platform. Um, but I, th I certainly think, um, as Paul was talking about moving to a system of multiple, both individual and um, common assessments, I think that adaptive software can be an enormous tool to do this at scale. Um, which is another whole area that we haven't even touched on in terms of why CompTIA-based education is going to be really tricky to actually spread statewide um, um, throughout the states we're talking about today. Thanks, Julia. Aubrey or Paul, anything? Or we have time for probably one more question before we need to wrap up. I mean, I think in our study we touched on assessment, but. Again, it was one of those issues that kept coming up that we said, you know, it wasn't one of our main research questions. So we've definitely put that in in our next research study is looking at how these schools and districts are using different forms of assessment in a competency-based model. And I think this is a huge question. And hopefully we can uh, get that next study out there so that we can answer and address some of these questions. Yeah, and I guess the only thing I would add is, you know, there are degrees of adaptive assessment, right? There's the, the formative assessment that follows um, uh, blended and, and online uh, systems uh, that, that is very much tied to the teaching and learning that's going on uh, at the moment. And then there are adaptive assessments like uh, Smarter Balance Assessment and NWEA and others where uh, you have a single moment in time, and uh, it's adapt adaptive to uh, how the student uh, actually uh, answers on on a given uh, question going forward. So, um, it's it's uh, worth uh, further discussion. Um, I I think that uh, it depends on on where the uh, adaptation is is going on, and and it, what form of assessment are you really trying to address? Is it formative or are you looking at, at, at a summative of experience? The other thing that I, I would just raise is um, in assessments, the issue of grain size is so important. We're really trying to um, have a, a higher, a larger grain size so that we can really uh, suss out, if you will, kind of a student's overall uh, sense and usability of, of the knowledge and skills that they've been gaining. Uh, so that we can demonstrate real, real competency as, as it relates to authentic tasks. Um, I think this is one of the big questions that needs to be addressed as we talk about um, the connection between blended, personalized, and competency-based learning, which I think many of us are moving uh, to a system that includes those, all of those pieces and uh, something that worthy of a, an, uh, another deep discussion. Thanks, Paul, and thank you, everyone. I think, um, you know, as we can see, you know, we had a lot of great information, and it's raising a lot of great questions, and, um, you know, more things to look into, and a great conversation. So I want to um, take a minute again to thank all of our presenters today for um, talking with us today, and thank you to all our participants for joining us today to talk about. It's obviously a rapidly growing field of work around competency-based learning. And we are definitely looking forward to continuing this conversation. And here at Bell Northeastern Islands, we do have some other additional reports coming out about the topic. So look forward to sharing those and working more with Paul and Julia and talking about all these events. Um, as you can see, we're always looking to improve on our events. So if you could take a minute at the end of the event today to complete the survey, we appreciate your feedback. Uh, the link is right up on here as well as down in the box. Uh, and I'd like. As I said, thank you again for all our presenters from on behalf of Rail Northeastern Island and the Northeast College and Career Readiness Alliance. And if you'd like additional information, feel free to reach out to any of the presenters or Josh or myself. And the recording of this webinar will be archived on the Rail Northeastern Islands website if you'd like to refer to anything discussed today or to share the link with anyone who is able to attend today's event. And also, um, our report will be posted up there as well as today's slides. Um, so thank you, everyone, for attending. And have a great afternoon. On behalf of the REL Northeastern Islands, thank you for joining us today. In two to three weeks, you will receive a thank you email from us with a link to the webinar archive. And as Jessica said, we appreciate your completion of the feedback survey. Have a wonderful evening. Goodbye.